Welcome back to the Gardening with Joey Nahali radio show. Moments away, our good friend and author, Jessica Wallacer. But first, do you have ants? Ants are not good in the garden, and they're certainly not good in the house. And Rescue has an ant bait that will get rid of them for you. Ant colonies become noticeable around the house starting in spring. I know for us, we get them every spring in our bathroom. They seek food and moisture sources to feed their colonies. Once they establish a food source, they lay pheromone trails for other ants to follow. So if you send these ants to the rescue ant ant bait stations, they will transport the bait back to their colony, killing ants at the source. Ants look for sugars to feed their workers and protein to feed the queen and larva. Rescue ant baits use both protein and sugar for a faster, more complete colony kill. Unlike any other ant baits that leak and spill all over your floor, rescue ant baits are spill-proof and mess-free. They're also child-resistant and safe to use around the home. Better bait, no mess, and child-resistant rescue ant baits have it all. Like all rescue products, like all rescue products, their ant baits are made in the USA. Rescue.com is where to buy. Again, that's rescue.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Jessica Walliser is an author, gardener, garden blogger, columnist, and all-around horticultural and botanical enthusiast. She lives in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania with her family. Welcome to the program, Jessica. Thank you so much, Holly. It's nice to be with you guys. Well, it's always nice to have you come back on the program. I've said this once, and I'll say it again. We always know when a new book has come out that Jessica has published because the the male woman or male man delivers it right to our door. So we know, hey, new book. (laughs) And uh, we're excited to have that. And we'll talk about that new book uh, momentarily. Now, most people know that bees are endangered or some some bees or a lot of bees are endangered. Um, Other than planting flowers and flowering plants, what are some ways that we can help the bees? Ah, that's a great question, Holly. Um, Yeah, you're right. There are some bees that are endangered, uh, but even those that aren't on any official list are actually facing some pretty dramatic population declines. um, And certainly a lack of forage uh, and nectar is part of it. As you mentioned, you know, planting a lot of diversity of flowers is a very good way to help those little bees, native bees in particular. Uh, But there's certainly other things we can do. Um, Number one for me is creating habitat for them. Um, not just foraging habitat, but also nesting habitat. Most of our 4,000-ish species of North American native bees actually nest in little tiny cavities by themselves. They're solitary nesters. They don't make like a big hive. So uh, anytime we can leave like hollow stems standing in the garden, uh, you know, when you do your spring cleanup, leave about eight to 10 inches of stubble on the perennials in your garden, especially those that have hollow stems. uh, And they will use those as little brood chambers. Um, And these are not bees that can sting. uh, They're very, um, you know, docile bees. So that's a great way to help them just by allowing them to have a space uh, to build a nest in your garden. Well, that's interesting. And I want to ask. Well, I want to ask about your book here. In your new book, Planting Partners, uh, Planting Partners, Science-Based Companion Planting Strategies, you talk about actual science behind true companion planting. What was one of the most surprising and unique companion planting techniques that you learned when writing this book? And and I ask you that because Holly and I we've talked to Garden Talks and, and online that you know you. Type in companion planting, you get 47 charts and 38 of them are completely different from one another. What was, and I like this because it's science based. What was the most unique thing that you learned uh, in this um, research? Yeah, that's a bit like asking me to pick a favorite child, uh, (laughs) which is why I only had one child. So I was never forced to pick a favorite. Right. Um, You know, it was it was crazy because during the research, you know, I was surprised to find just literally hundreds of studies that examined plant partnerships. Um, in the garden in different ways that they could could benefit us. Um, I would say probably, um, you know, the pest management aspect of companion planting seems to be the most popular mission for gardeners, right? That's the reason why they employ companion planting. So I would say some of the strategies that I found actual research on in terms of pest management um, were most surprising to me, uh, in particular, the uh, number of studies that were done on trap cropping, which is where you're basically partnering two plants together. And one of them is 
you know, meant to sort of lure away the pests from the desired plant. So it becomes almost like a sacrificial plant, right, that you're planting so that the bug damage is on that plant instead of your main plant. So like uh, in my garden, I always plant my radishes right next to my uh, tomato transplants. And that's because we have a major issue with flea beetles. So flea beetles much prefer the radish in my garden. So they'll go to the radish and they'll leave my young tomato transplants alone. So it's a great way to sort of lure them away from the plants that you, you know, I can still harvest the radish, obviously, because they don't damage the roots. They only damage the leaves, but I end up getting healthier tomatoes as a result. That's definitely, trap planting is definitely uh, a really, I think, really great idea. Now, many of us have heard of polyculture and it's increasing and it, how it increases plant di- biodiversity. Does companion planting do the same? Is it a similar science, kind of like the uh, trap planting? But, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in in a lot of ways, um, you know, they're one and the same because companion planting is partnering plants together. A lot of people think it has to be like plant A with plant B, you know, that it has to be just two plants together. But the way I like to think of it and the way I talk about in plant partners is that it is creating a polyculture. It's not just two plants partnered together. It's basically creating a very biodiverse environment where uh, the result of all of that biodiversity is stability. It's fewer pest outbreaks. It's fewer disease outbreaks. It's fewer weeds, right? So we all know diversity equals stability. I mean, that's t- true in people too, right? In all ecosystems. Um, and so we can definitely do that in the garden. I mean, that that should be a mission to build that polyculture of as many species as possible. Instead of everything being in a straight row in your vegetable garden, you know, a row of cabbages, a row of peppers, a row of tomatoes, mix it all up. Get some flowering herbs in there and um, and flowering annual plants, and that's going to improve that biodiversity and make your garden a more stable place. Well, you are the bug lady. You wrote the book, Good Bug, Bad Bug. And I'll ask you, what are some well-known good bugs that most people have in their garden, and how can we keep those good bugs in the garden or attract more good bugs? I know there's got to be a little balance of good and bad in order for the, the bio, you know, everything to work out, but how can we bring in more good bugs, and how can we keep the ones we have, and what are some of them? Yeah, so I'll answer the second question first, which is how we keep them. And one of the main ways we keep them is goes back to that biodiversity and that turning your vegetable garden into a polyculture of mixed plants together, because that's really the kind of habitat that they need. That's the shelter that they need. Um, a lot of them, even though they will eat other bugs, right, that's their protein source. Um, they'll eat aphids and, uh, you know, spider mites and white flies and things like that. But another part of their diet has to be carbohydrates, and that's found in nectar. So the more greater diversity of flowering plants that you can have in your garden, the better it is for all of these good bugs as well. So that can be things like hoverflies, also called seraphid flies. Um, they, they're sort of a bee mimic. They look a little bit like a bee. A lot of them have the sort of black and yellow stripes on them. Um, and you'll see them kind of hovering around your flowers and particular members of the daisy fa- family, which they really love to nectar on. The adults are pollinators. It's actually their larvae that are predaceous. So they eat, uh, they love to eat aphids, right? So you see them a lot of times kind of like a little slug-like creature that crawls around on your plants and eats aphids. So they're a really, really common one to see in gar- gardens. Um, of course, ladybugs are another really good one. Ladybugs love to nectar on members of the carrot family. So that could be uh, dill, parsley that goes to flower, fennel that you leave go to flower, anything that sort of has that umbrella shaped flower. Uh, you know, flower clusters together is really, really good for ladybugs. uh, And they're predaceous both in the adult stage and the larval stage as well. So yeah, my book, Good Bug, Bad Bug, I have another one attracting beneficial bugs to your garden where I really dive into a whole bunch of these different species of beneficial insects and how you can use them to your advantage in the garden. Now with people who are maybe new to gardening and they see videos of people purchasing bugs, good bugs to let loose in their garden. Do you recommend that? Do you not recommend that? Or is there, it's a balance of a good and a bad thing altogether? Yeah, that's a great question, Joey. I mean, I, I personally don't recommend it. And there's a couple reasons why. Um, 
the main fact is that you already have a lot of these good bugs in your garden. I mean, unless you are regularly blanketing your garden with, you know, a broad spectrum pesticides, you have a lot of good bugs already there. So I would much rather encourage people to um, encourage all of those good bugs that are already there, right? I mean, create an environment that welcomes them. Stop using the pesticides to allow them to do their work on your behalf. Um, and that should be your goal. It should be, should be fostering the indigenous population as much as possible. Um, the other thing is when you buy them in, when you buy, you know, beneficial insects in, sometimes you could be bringing diseases, you know, into the indigenous population in your garden. It's cost you money. And of course, there's no guarantee that they're going to stick around, right? Uh, the other thing with ladybugs, if you purchase ladybugs, like the little canisters you sometimes see at the garden center, you know, on the on the shelf there by the checkout, um, those are almost always convergent ladybugs, which is a North American native ladybug species, but they're actually wild collected. They're wild collected from mountaintops where they, they um, overwinter in large groups. And so they, they suck them up with backpack vacuums, package them up and ship them to places all over the country. So it's also impacting in that case, wild populations as well. So it's much better to just encourage the ones that you already have in your garden. Definitely. Now, many people struggle with keeping their containers watered, um, especially during the peak of the summer. Maybe they're not home to check them during the middle of the day. What are some good irrigation watering techniques for containers? Ah, that's a good question, too, because I I, uh, I think I have a YouTube video coming out about this soon, about really the proper way to water containers. You know, a lot of people do what I, I like to call the splash and dash method, which is where they're just sort of like sprinkling the water on top of the plants. And they sort of splash it on there and, oh, that's good enough. And then they, they walk away, right? And that's kind of like watering in a hurry. That is not effective watering of patio containers. I mean, to really get good, thorough, deep watering in your containers, you want to target the application of the water right onto the soil surface. There's no need to get the foliage wet at all. You're not cooling off the plant or anything like that. You target it right at the soil level. And what you really want to do is you want to let that hose or watering can really run on the the you know soil until at least 20% of the volume of water that you put in the top of the pot comes out the drainage hole in the bottom that's flushing through the excess fertilizer salts and it's really letting the water to get down deep into the root system of the plants and then do it two or three times on each pot. So I water a container. I might have the hose on it for, you know, 30 or 60 seconds. Then I go to the next container and do it. Then I go back to the first container and do it again, right? That's what it takes to really, especially if the soil is really dry, that's what it takes to really get good, thorough saturation in that potting soil. Well, and for new gardeners, and I, I would guess that many experienced gardeners do not have, do not realize how long and how much water it takes to actually hydrate a dried out container. It's one of the biggest issues that I see with container gardeners, really, especially new ones. You know, they, they want to know why they failed, why their plant is yellowing. And, oh, but I'm watering, I'm watering. And I'll say, well, how are you watering? Mm -hmm. You know, because if you're doing the splash and dash, you're not going to have healthy, productive plants. Um, and, and the other trick I found is that if I mix my potting soil about 50-50 with high quality finished compost, that compost almost acts as a sponge and it really holds on to the moisture in the soil. Uh, in, in the potting soil, it makes it a little bit um, sturdier, so to speak, right? And it really holds on to water a lot longer. So I have to water a little bit less when I do that. So in almost all my containers, unless I'm growing a cactus or a succulent, I will mix it 50-50 with compost and potting soil. Yeah, if you think you've got it watered, take your finger and scratch down about an inch. You'll realize probably not watered enough because it's bone dry there. It is. And it's, you know, I would say to people too, like if you're, if you're not sure, you know, if it's a, if it's a smaller sort of plastic container that it's real easy to kind of pop the root ball of the plant out of there. When you think you've watered enough, try to pop that root out and I bet you halfway down the container. Yeah. It'll be bone dry in there. Okay. Well, um, we, we just want to know for our listeners, how we can find out more about you, where to find your books, all of your great information and the uh, YouTube video that you're going to be doing about keeping containers water and all your great information. 
Sure. So they can find me in uh, probably the primary way to find me is through my website, which is Savvy Gardening, S-A-V-V-Y, Gardening, Savvy Gardening. Uh, and we're on all social media channels. That's myself and my two uh, business partners there, Nikki Jabor and Tara Nolan, who are also fellow horticulturists and garden writers. Uh, and so we do, we, you know, that's all our social media channels are Savvy Gardening, which would be um, YouTube and Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, all those guys. So find us there. My books, um, including Plant Partners and all my insect oriented books are all available wherever books are sold, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, bookshop.org or your independent booksellers. Whether you're a new gardener or a weekend warrior or advanced gardener, the book is something you need to get. It's something that has educated Holly and I to a level that we didn't think, you know, we learned, we have learned a lot from your book and we advise other people and encourage other people to purchase it. Oh, I'm so pleased to hear you say that because I know what uh, experienced gardeners you are. And my goal with the book was definitely to, you know, be able to teach even folks who have been gardening for a very long time a few new tricks. Well, Jessica, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered us. And uh, thank you for being with us on the program today. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. Hey there, gardeners. Thanks for checking out this segment of the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. If you like what you've seen, you can search through the channel and find full in-studio videos of the entire show. If you want to go another route, you can search for it on your favorite podcast platform by searching the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener radio show or the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show, and you can download it and take it with you. You can check out all past seasons at our website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, under the radio tabs at the top of the page. We thank you for joining us. We hope you've learned and enjoyed the show, the segment, and we'll see you next time.